For the Pythagoreans, they were even divine. But you are certainly unaware of this when you use numbers for a practical purpose. Every concept in our conscious mind, in short, has its own psychic associations. While such associations may vary in intensity according to the relative importance of the concept to our whole personality, or according to the other ideas and even complexes to which it is associated in our unconscious, they are capable of changing the normal character of that concept. It may even become something quite different as it drifts below the level of consciousness. These subliminal aspects of everything that happens to us may seem to play very little part in our daily lives, but in dream analysis, where the psychologist is dealing with expressions of the unconscious, they are very relevant, for they are the almost invisible roots of our conscious thoughts. That is why commonplace objects or ideas can assume such powerful psychic significance in a dream that we may awake seriously disturbed in spite of having dreamed of nothing worse than a locked room or a missed train. The images produced in dreams are much more picturesque and vivid than the concepts and experiences that are their waking counterparts. One of the reasons for this is that in a dream such concepts can express their unconscious meaning. In our conscious thoughts, we restrain ourselves within the limits of rational statements, statements that are much less colorful because we have stripped them of most of their psychic associations. I recall one dream of my own that I found difficult to interpret. In this dream, a certain man was trying to get behind me and jump on my back. I knew nothing of this man except that I was aware that he had somehow picked up a remark I had made and had twisted it into a grotesque travesty of my meaning but I could not see the connection between this fact and his attempt in the dream to jump on me. In my professional life, however, it has often happened that someone has misrepresented what I have said, so often that I have scarcely bothered to wonder whether this kind of misrepresentation makes me angry. Now there is a certain value in keeping a conscious control over one's emotional reactions, and this, I soon realized, was the point the dream had made. It had taken an Austrian colloquialism and translated it into a pictorial image. This phrase, common enough in ordinary speech, is Du kannst mir auf den Buckel steigen. You can climb on my back, which means I don't care what you say about me. An American equivalent, which could easily appear in a similar dream, would be Go jump in the lake. One could say that this dream picture was symbolic for it did not state the situation directly, but expressed the point indirectly by means of a metaphor that I could not at first understand. When this happens, as it so often does, it is not deliberate disguise by a dream. It simply reflects the deficiencies in our understanding of emotionally charged pictorial language, for in our daily experience we need to state things as accurately as possible, and we have learned to discard the trimmings of fantasy both in our language and in our thoughts thus losing a quality that is still characteristic of the primitive mind. Most of us have consigned to the unconscious all the fantastic psychic associations that every object or idea possesses. The primitive, on the other hand, is still aware of these psychic properties. He endows animals, plants, or stones with powers that we find strange and unacceptable. An African jungle dweller, for instance, sees a nocturnal creature by daylight and knows it to be a medicine man who has temporarily taken its shape, or he may regard it as the bush soul or ancestral spirit of one of his tribe. A tree may play a vital part in the life of a primitive, apparently possessing for him its own soul and voice, and the man concerned will feel that he shares its fate. There are some Indians in South America who will assure you that they are red aurora parrots, though they are well aware that they lack feathers, wings, and beaks. For in the primitive's world, Things do not have the same sharp boundaries they do in our rational societies. What psychologists call psychic identity or mystical participation has been stripped off our world of things. But it is exactly this halo of unconscious associations that gives a colorful and fantastic aspect to the primitive's world. We have lost it to such a degree that we do not recognize it when we meet it again. With us, such things are kept below the threshold, when they occasionally reappear, we even insist that something is wrong. I have more than once been consulted by well-educated and intelligent people who have had peculiar dreams, fantasies, or even visions which have shocked them deeply. They have assumed that no one who is in a sound state of mind could suffer from such things, 
and that anyone who actually sees a vision must be pathologically disturbed. A theologian once told me that Ezekiel's visions were nothing more than morbid symptoms, and that when Moses and other prophets heard voices speaking to them, they were suffering from hallucinations. You can imagine the panic he felt when something of this kind spontaneously happened to him. We are so accustomed to the apparently rational nature of our world that we can scarcely imagine anything happening that cannot be explained by common sense. The primitive man, confronted by a shock of this kind, would not doubt his sanity. He would think of fetishes, spirits, or gods. Yet the emotions that affect us are just the same. In fact, the terrors that stem from our elaborate civilization may be far more threatening than those that primitive people attribute to demons. The attitude of modern civilized man sometimes reminds me of a psychotic patient in my clinic who was himself a doctor. One morning I asked him how he was. He replied that he had had a wonderful night disinfecting the whole of heaven with mercuric chloride, but that in the course of this thoroughgoing sanitary process he had found no trace of God. Here we see a neurosis, or something worse. Instead of God or the fear of God, there is an anxiety neurosis, or some kind of phobia. The emotion has remained the same, but its object has changed both its name and nature for the worse. I recall a professor of philosophy who once consulted me about his cancer phobia. He suffered from a compulsive conviction that he had a malignant tumor, although nothing of the kind was ever found in dozens of x-ray pictures. Oh, I know there is nothing, he would say, but there might be something. What was it that produced this idea? It obviously came from a fear that was not instilled by conscious deliberation. The morbid thought suddenly overcame him, and it had a power of its own that he could not control. It was far more difficult for this educated man to make an admission of this kind than it would have been for a primitive to say that he was plagued by a ghost. The malign influence of evil spirits is at least an admissible hypothesis in a primitive culture, but it is a shattering experience for a civilized person to admit that his troubles are nothing more than a foolish prank of the imagination. The primitive phenomenon of obsession has not vanished. It is the same as ever. It is only interpreted in a different and more obnoxious way. I have made several comparisons of this kind between modern and primitive man. Such comparisons, as I shall show later, are essential to an understanding of the symbol-making propensities of man and of the part that dreams play in expressing them. For one finds that many dreams present images and associations that are analogous to primitive ideas, myths, and rites. These dream images were called archaic remnants by Freud. The phrase suggests that they are psychic elements surviving in the human mind from ages long ago. This point of view is characteristic of those who regard the unconscious as a mere appendix of consciousness, or, more picturesquely, as a trash can that collects all the refuse of the conscious mind. Further investigation suggested to me that this attitude is untenable and should be discarded. I found that associations and images of this kind are an integral part of the unconscious and can be observed everywhere, whether the dreamer is educated or illiterate, intelligent or stupid. They are not in any sense lifeless or meaningless remnants. They still function, and they are especially valuable, as Dr. Henderson shows in a later chapter of this book, just because of their historical nature. They form a bridge between the ways in which we consciously express our thoughts and a more primitive, more colorful and pictorial form of expression. It is this form as well that appeals directly to feeling and emotion. These historical associations are the link between the rational world of consciousness and the world of instinct. I have already discussed the interesting contrast between the controlled thoughts we have in waking life and the wealth of imagery produced in dreams. Now you can see another reason for this difference. Because in our civilized life we have stripped so many ideas of their emotional energy, we do not really respond to them anymore. We use such ideas in our speech, and we show a conventional reaction when others use them, but they do not make a very deep impression on us. Something more is needed to bring certain things home to us effectively enough to make us change our attitude and behavior. This is what dream language does. Its symbolism has so much psychic energy that we are forced to pay attention to it. 
There was, for instance, a lady who was well known for her stupid prejudices and her stubborn resistance to reasoned argument. One could have argued with her all night to no effect. She would have taken not the slightest notice. Her dreams, however, took a different line of approach. One night she dreamed she was attending an important social occasion. She was greeted by the hostess with the words, How nice that you could come. All your friends are here and they are waiting for you. The hostess then led her to the door and opened it, and the dreamer stepped through into a cowshed. This dream language was simple enough to be understood even by a blockhead. The woman would not at first admit the point of a dream that struck so directly at her self-importance, but its message nevertheless went home, and after a time she had to accept it because she could not help seeing the self-inflicted joke. Such messages from the unconscious are of greater importance than most people realize. In our conscious life, we are exposed to all kinds of influences. Other people stimulate or depress us. Events at the office or in our social life distract us. Such things seduce us into following ways that are unsuitable to our individuality. Whether or not we are aware of the effect they have on our consciousness, it is disturbed by and exposed to them almost without defense. This is especially the case with a person whose extroverted attitude of mind lays all the emphasis upon external objects, or who harbors feelings of inferiority and doubt concerning his own innermost personality. The more that consciousness is influenced by prejudices, errors, fantasies, and infantile wishes, the more the already existing gap will widen into a neurotic dissociation and lead to a more or less artificial life far removed from healthy instincts, nature, and truth. The general function of dreams is to try to restore our psychological balance by producing dream material that re-establishes, in a subtle way, the total psychic equilibrium. That is what I call the complementary or compensatory role of dreams in our psychic makeup. It explains why people who have unrealistic ideas or too high an opinion of themselves or who make grandiose plans out of proportion to their real capacities, have dreams of flying or falling. The dream compensates for the deficiencies of their personalities, and at the same time it warns them of the dangers in their present course. If the warnings of the dream are disregarded, real accidents may take their place. The victim may fall downstairs or may have a motor accident. I remember the case of a man who was inextricably involved in a number of shady affairs. He developed an almost morbid passion for dangerous mountain climbing as a sort of compensation. He was seeking to get above himself. In a dream one night, he saw himself stepping off the summit of a high mountain into empty space. When he told me his dream, I instantly saw his danger and tried to emphasize the warning and persuade him to restrain himself. I even told him that the dream foreshadows his death in a mountain accident. It was in vain. Six months later, he stepped off into space. A mountain guide watched him and a friend letting themselves down on a rope in a difficult place. The friend had found a temporary foothold on a ledge, and the dreamer was following him down. Suddenly he let go of the rope, according to the guide, as if he were jumping into the air. He fell upon his friend, and both went down and were killed. End of side one. To continue, turn the cassette over. Two. Man and His Symbols by Carl G. Jung. Continuing with Approaching the Unconscious on page 50. Another typical case was that of a lady who was living above herself. She was high and mighty in her daily life, but she had shocking dreams, reminding her of all sorts of unsavory things. When I discovered them, she indignantly refused to acknowledge them. The dreams then became menacing and full of references to the walks she used to take by herself in the woods where she indulged in soulful fantasies. I saw her danger, but she would not listen to my many warnings. Soon afterwards, she was savagely attacked in the woods by a sexual pervert, but for the intervention of some people who heard her screams, she would have been killed. There was no magic in this. What her dreams had told me was that this woman had a secret longing for such an adventure, just as the mountain climber unconsciously sought the satisfaction of finding a definite way out of his difficulties. Obviously, neither of them expected the stiff price involved. She had several bones broken, and he paid with his life. 
Thus, dreams may sometimes announce certain situations long before they actually happen. This is not necessarily a miracle or a form of precognition. Many crises in our lives have a long unconscious history. We move toward them step by step, unaware of the dangers that are accumulating. But what we consciously fail to see is frequently perceived by our unconscious, which can pass the information on through dreams. Dreams may often warn us in this way, but just as often it seems they do not. Therefore, any assumption of a benevolent hand restraining us in time is dubious, or, to state it more positively, it seems that a benevolent agency is sometimes at work and sometimes not. The mysterious hand may even point the way to perdition. Dreams sometimes prove to be traps, or appear to be so. They sometimes behave like the Delphic oracle that told King Croesus that if he crossed the Halus River he would destroy a large kingdom. It was only after he had been completely defeated in battle, after the crossing, that he discovered that the kingdom meant by the oracle was his own. One cannot afford to be naive in dealing with dreams. They originate in a spirit that is not quite human, but is rather a breath of nature, a spirit of the beautiful and generous as well as of the cruel goddess. If we want to characterize this spirit, we shall certainly get closer to it in the sphere of ancient mythologies or the fables of the primeval forest than in the consciousness of modern man. I am not denying that great gains have resulted from the evolution of civilized society, but these gains have been made at the price of enormous losses whose extent we have scarcely begun to estimate. Part of the purpose of my comparisons between the primitive and the civilized states of man has been to show the balance of these losses and gains. Primitive man was much more governed by his instincts than are his rational modern descendants who have learned to control themselves. In this civilizing process we have increasingly divided our consciousness from the deeper instinctive strata of the human psyche and even ultimately from the somatic basis of the psychic phenomenon. Fortunately, we have not lost these basic instinctive strata. They remain part of the unconscious, even though they may express themselves only in the form of dream images. These instinctive phenomena, one may not incidentally always recognize them for what they are, for their character is symbolic, play a vital part in what I have called the compensating function of dreams. For the sake of mental stability and even physiological health, the unconscious and the conscious must be integrally connected and thus move on parallel lines. If they are split apart or dissociated, psychological disturbance follows. In this respect, dream symbols are the essential message carriers from the instinctive to the rational parts of the human mind, and their interpretation enriches the poverty of consciousness so that it learns to understand again the forgotten language of the instincts. Of course, people are bound to query this function, since its symbols so often pass unnoticed or uncomprehended. In normal life, the understanding of dreams is often considered superfluous. I can illustrate this by my experience with a primitive tribe in East Africa. To my amazement, these tribesmen denied that they had any dreams, but through patient, indirect talks with them, I soon found that they had dreams just like everyone else, but that they were convinced their dreams had no meaning. Dreams of ordinary men mean nothing, they told me. They thought that the only dreams that mattered were those of chiefs and medicine men. These, which concerned the welfare of the tribe, were highly appreciated. The only drawback was that the chief and the medicine man both claimed that they had ceased having meaningful dreams. They dated this change from the time that the British came to their country. The district commissioner, the British official in charge of them, had taken over the function of the great dreams that had hitherto guided the tribe's behavior. When these tribesmen conceded that they did have dreams but thought them meaningless, they were like the modern man who thinks that a dream has no significance for him simply because he does not understand it. But even a civilized man can sometimes observe that a dream, which he may not even remember, can alter his mood for better or worse. The dream has been comprehended, but only in a subliminal way. And that is what usually happens. It is only on the rare occasions when a dream is particularly impressive or repeats itself at regular intervals that most people consider an interpretation desirable. Here I ought to add a word of warning against unintelligent or incompetent dream analysis. There are some people whose mental condition is so unbalanced 
that the interpretation of their dreams can be extremely risky. In such a case, a very one-sided consciousness is cut off from a correspondingly irrational or crazy unconscious, and the two should not be brought together without taking special precautions. And, speaking more generally, it is plain foolishness to believe in ready-made systematic guides to dream interpretation, as if one could simply buy a reference book and look up a particular symbol. No dream symbol can be separated from the individual who dreams it, and there is no definite or straightforward interpretation of any dream. Each individual varies so much in the way that his unconscious complements or compensates his conscious mind that it is impossible to be sure how far dreams and their symbols can be classified at all. It is true that there are dreams and single symbols, I should prefer to call them motifs, that are typical and often occur. Among such motifs are falling, flying, being persecuted by dangerous animals or hostile men, being insufficiently or absurdly clothed in public places, being in a hurry or lost in a milling crowd, fighting with useless weapons or being wholly defenseless, running hard yet getting nowhere. A typical infantile motif is the dream of growing infinitely small or infinitely big or being transformed from one to the other, as you find it, for instance, in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. But I must stress again that these are motifs that must be considered in the context of the dream itself, not as self-explanatory ciphers. The recurring dream is a noteworthy phenomenon. There are cases in which people have dreamed the same dream from childhood into the later years of adult life. A dream of this kind is usually an attempt to compensate for a particular defect in the dreamer's attitude to life, or it may date from a traumatic moment that is left behind some specific prejudice. It may also sometimes anticipate a future event of importance. I myself dreamed of a motif over several years in which I would discover a part of my house that I did not know existed. Sometimes it was the quarters where my long-dead parents lived, in which my father, to my surprise, had a laboratory where he studied the comparative anatomy of fish, and my mother ran a hotel for ghostly visitors. Usually this unfamiliar guest wing was an ancient historical building, long forgotten, yet my inherited property. It contained interesting antique furniture, and toward the end of this series of dreams I discovered an old library whose books were unknown to me. Finally, in the last dream, I opened one of the books and found in it a profusion of the most marvelous symbolic pictures. When I awoke, my heart was palpitating with excitement. Some time before I had this particular last dream of the series, I had placed an order with an antiquarian bookseller for one of the classic compilations of medieval alchemists. I had found a quotation in literature that I thought might have some connection with early Byzantine alchemy, and I wished to check it. Several weeks after I had had the dream of the unknown book, a parcel arrived from the bookseller. Inside was a parchment volume dating from the 16th century. It was illustrated by fascinating symbolic pictures that instantly reminded me of those I had seen in my dream. As the rediscovery of the principles of alchemy came to be an important part of my work as a pioneer of psychology, the motif of my recurring dream can easily be understood. The house, of course, was a symbol of my personality and its conscious field of interests, and the unknown annex represented the anticipation of a new field of interest and research of which my conscious mind was at that time unaware. From that moment, thirty years ago, I never had the dream again. The Analysis of Dreams I began this essay by noting the difference between a sign and a symbol. The sign is always less than the concept it represents, while a symbol always stands for something more than its obvious and immediate meaning. Symbols, moreover, are natural and spontaneous products. No genius has ever sat down with a pen or a brush in his hand and said, Now I am going to invent a symbol. No one can take a more or less rational thought, reached as a logical conclusion, or by deliberate intent, and then give it symbolic form. No matter what fantastic trappings one may put upon an idea of this kind, it will still remain a sign, linked to the conscious thought behind it, not a symbol that hints at something not yet known. In dreams, symbols occur spontaneously, for dreams happen and are not invented. They are, therefore, the main source of all our knowledge about symbolism. 
But symbols, I must point out, do not occur solely in dreams. They appear in all kinds of psychic manifestations. There are symbolic thoughts and feelings, symbolic acts and situations. It often seems that even inanimate objects cooperate with the unconscious in the arrangement of symbolic patterns. There are numerous well-authenticated stories of clocks stopping at the moment of their owner's death. One was the pendulum clock in the palace of Frederick the Great at Sanssouci, which stopped when the king died. Other common examples are those of a mirror that breaks or a picture that falls when the death occurs, or minor but unexplained breakages in a house where someone is passing through an emotional crisis. Even if skeptics refuse to credit such reports, stories of this kind are always cropping up, and this alone should serve as ample proof of their psychological importance. There are many symbols, however, among them the most important, that are not individual but collective in their nature and origin. These are chiefly religious images. The believer assumes that they are of divine origin, that they have been revealed to man. The skeptic says flatly that they have been invented. Both are wrong. It is true, as the skeptic notes, that religious symbols and concepts have for centuries been the object of careful and quite conscious elaboration. It is equally true, as the believer implies, that their origin is so far buried in the mystery of the past that they seem to have no human source. But they are in fact collective representations, emanating from primeval dreams and creative fantasies. As such, these images are involuntary spontaneous manifestations and by no means intentional inventions. This fact, as I shall later explain, has a direct and important bearing upon the interpretation of dreams. It is obvious that if you assume the dream to be symbolic, you will interpret it differently from a person who believes that the essential energizing thought or emotion is known already and is merely disguised by the dream. In the latter case, dream interpretation makes little sense, for you find only what you already know. It is for this reason that I have always said to my pupils, learn as much as you can about symbolism, then forget it all when you are analyzing a dream. This advice is of such practical importance that I have made it a rule to remind myself that I can never understand somebody else's dream well enough to interpret it correctly. I have done this in order to check the flow of my own associations and reactions which might otherwise prevail over my patient's uncertainties and hesitations, as it is of the greatest therapeutic importance for an analyst to get the particular message of a dream, that is, the contribution that the unconscious is making to the conscious mind, as accurately as possible, it is essential for him to explore the content of the dream with the utmost thoroughness. I had a dream when I was working with Freud that illustrates this point. I dreamed that I was in my home, apparently on the first floor, in a cozy, pleasant sitting room furnished in the manner of the eighteenth century. I was astonished that I had never seen this room before, and began to wonder what the ground floor was like. I went downstairs and found the place was rather dark, with paneled walls and heavy furniture dating from the sixteenth century or even earlier. My surprise and curiosity increased. I wanted to see more of the whole structure of this house, so I went down to the cellar, where I found a door opening onto a flight of stone steps that led to a large vaulted room. The floor consisted of large slabs of stone, and the walls seemed very ancient. I examined the mortar and found it was mixed with splinters of brick, Obviously the walls were of Roman origin. I became increasingly excited. In one corner I saw an iron ring on a stone slab. I pulled up the slab and saw yet another narrow flight of steps leading to a kind of cave which seemed to be a prehistoric tomb containing two skulls, some bones, and broken shards of pottery. Then I woke up. If Freud, when he analyzed this dream, had followed my method of exploring its specific associations and context, he would have heard a far-reaching story, but I am afraid he would have dismissed it as a mere effort to escape from a problem that was really his own. The dream is in fact a short summary of my life, more specifically of the development of my mind. I grew up in a house two hundred years old. Our furniture consisted mostly of pieces about three hundred years old, and mentally my hitherto greatest spiritual adventure had been to study the philosophies of Kant and Schopenhauer. The great news of the day was the work of Charles Darwin. 
Shortly before this, I had been living with the still medieval concepts of my parents, for whom the world and men were still presided over by divine omnipotence and providence. This world had become antiquated and obsolete. My Christian faith had become relative through its encounter with Eastern religions and Greek philosophy. It is for this reason that the ground floor was so still, dark, and obviously uninhabited. My then historical interests had developed from an original preoccupation with comparative anatomy and paleontology while I was working as an assistant at the Anatomical Institute. I was fascinated by the bones of fossil man, particularly by the much-discussed Neanderthalensis and the still more controversial skull of Dubois' Pithecanthropus. As a matter of fact, these were my real associations to the dream but I did not dare to mention the subject of skulls, skeletons, or corpses to Freud because I had learned that this theme was not popular with him. He cherished the peculiar idea that I anticipated his early death, and he drew this conclusion from the fact that I had shown much interest in the mummified corpses in the so-called Bleikeller in Bremen, which we visited together in 1909 on our way to take the boat to America. Thus I felt reluctant to come out with my own thoughts since through recent experience I was deeply impressed by the almost unbridgeable gap between Freud's mental outlook and background and my own. I was afraid of losing his friendship if I should open up to him about my own inner world, which I surmised would look very queer to him. Feeling quite uncertain about my own psychology, I almost automatically told him a lie about my free associations in order to escape the impossible task of enlightening him about my very personal and utterly different constitution. I must apologize for this rather lengthy narration of the jam I got into through telling Freud my dream, but it is a good example of the difficulties in which one gets involved in the course of a real dream analysis. So much depends upon the personal differences between the analyst and the analyzed. I soon realized that Freud was looking for some incompatible wish of mine, and so I suggested tentatively that the skulls I had dreamed of might refer to certain members of my family whose death for some reason I might desire. This proposal met with his approval, but I was not satisfied with such a phony solution. While I was trying to find a suitable answer to Freud's questions, I was suddenly confused by an intuition about the role that the subjective factor plays in psychological understanding. My intuition was so overwhelming that I thought only of how to get out of this impossible snarl, and I took the easy way out by a lie. This was neither elegant nor morally defensible, but otherwise I should have risked a fatal row with Freud, and I did not feel up to that for many reasons. My intuition consisted of the sudden and most unexpected insight into the fact that my dream meant myself, my life, and my world, my whole reality against a theoretical structure erected by another strange mind for reasons and purposes of its own. It was not Freud's dream, it was mine, and I understood suddenly in a flash what my dream meant, this conflict illustrates a vital point about dream analysis. It is not so much a technique that can be learned and applied according to the rules as it is a dialectical exchange between two personalities. If it is handled as a mechanical technique, the individual psychic personality of the dreamer gets lost and the therapeutic problem is reduced to the simple question, which of the two people concerned, the analyst or the dreamer, will dominate the other? I gave up hypnotic treatment for this very reason, because I did not want to impose my will on others. I wanted the healing processes to grow out of the patient's own personality, not from suggestions by me that would have only a passing effect. My aim was to protect and preserve my patient's dignity and freedom so that he could live his life according to his own wishes. In this exchange with Freud, it dawned on me for the first time that before we construct general theories about man and his psyche, we should learn a lot more about the real human being we have to deal with. The individual is the only reality. The further we move away from the individual toward abstract ideas about Homo sapiens, the more likely we are to fall into error. In these times of social upheaval and rapid change, it is desirable to know much more than we do about the individual human being for so much depends upon his mental and moral qualities. But if we are to see things in their right perspective, we need to understand the past of man as well as his present. That is why an understanding of myths and symbols is of essential importance. The Problem of Types 
In all other branches of science, it is legitimate to apply a hypothesis to an impersonal subject. Psychology, however, inescapably confronts you with the living relations between two individuals, neither of whom can be divested of his subjective personality, nor indeed depersonalized in any other way. The analyst and his patient may set out by agreeing to deal with a chosen problem in an impersonal and objective manner, but once they are engaged, their whole personalities are involved in their discussion. At this point, further progress is possible only if mutual agreement can be reached. Can we make any sort of objective judgment about the final result? Only if we make a comparison between our conclusions and the standards that are generally valid in the social milieu to which the individuals belong. Even then, we must take into account the mental equilibrium or sanity of the individual concerned. For the result cannot be a completely collective leveling out of the individual to adjust him to the norms of his society. This would amount to a most unnatural condition. A sane and normal society is one in which people habitually disagree because general agreement is relatively rare outside the sphere of instinctive human qualities. Disagreement functions as a vehicle of mental life in society, but it is not a goal. Agreement is equally important. Because psychology basically depends upon balanced opposites, no judgment can be considered to be final in which its reversibility has not been taken into account. The reason for this peculiarity lies in the fact that there is no standpoint above or outside psychology that would enable us to form an ultimate judgment of what the psyche is. In spite of the fact that dreams demand individual treatment, some generalities are necessary in order to classify and clarify the material that the psychologist collects by studying many individuals. It would obviously be impossible to formulate any psychological theory or to teach it by describing large numbers of separate cases without any effort to see what they have in common and how they differ. Any general characteristic can be chosen as a basis. One can, for instance, make a relatively simple distinction between individuals who have extroverted personalities and others who are introverted. This is only one of many possible generalizations, but it enables one to see immediately the difficulties that can arise if the analyst should happen to be one type and his patient the other. Since any deeper analysis of dreams leads to the confrontation of two individuals, it will obviously make a great difference whether their types of attitude are the same or not. If both belong to the same type, they may sail along happily for a long time, but if one is an extrovert and the other an introvert, their different and contradictory standpoints may clash right away, particularly when they are unaware of their own type of personality or when they are convinced that their own is the only right type. The extrovert, for instance, will choose the majority view. The introvert will reject it simply because it is fashionable. Such a misunderstanding is easy enough because the value of the one is the non-value of the other. Freud himself, for instance, interpreted the introverted type as an individual morbidly concerned with himself. But introspection and self-knowledge can just as well be of the greatest value and importance. It is vitally necessary to take account of such differences of personality in dream interpretation. It cannot be assumed that the analyst is a superman who is above such differences, just because he is a doctor who has acquired a psychological theory and a corresponding technique. He can only imagine himself to be superior insofar as he assumes that his theory and technique are absolute truths capable of embracing the whole of the human psyche. Since such an assumption is more than doubtful, he cannot really be sure of it. Consequently, he will be assailed by secret doubts if he confronts the human wholeness of his patient with a theory or technique, which is merely a hypothesis or an attempt, instead of with his own living wholeness. The analyst's whole personality is the only adequate equivalent of his patient's personality. Psychological experience and knowledge do not amount to more than mere advantages on the side of the analyst. They do not keep him outside the fray in which he is bound to be tested just as much as his patient. Thus, it matters a good deal whether their personalities are harmonious, in conflict, or complementary. Extroversion and introversion are just two among many peculiarities of human behavior, but they are often rather obvious and easily recognizable. If one studies extroverted individuals, for instance, one soon discovers that they differ in many ways from one another, 
and that being extroverted is therefore a superficial and too general criterion to be really characteristic. That is why, long ago, I tried to find some further basic peculiarities, peculiarities that might serve the purpose of giving some order to the apparently limitless variations in human individuality. I had always been impressed by the fact that there are a surprising number of individuals who never use their minds if they can avoid it, and an equal number who do use their minds, but in an amazingly stupid way. I was also surprised to find many intelligent and wide-awake people who lived, as far as one could make out, as if they had never learned to use their sense organs. They did not see the things before their eyes, hear the words sounding in their ears, or notice the things they touched or tasted. Some lived without being aware of the state of their own bodies. There were others who seemed to live in a most curious condition of consciousness, as if the state they had arrived at today were final, with no possibility of change, or as if the world and the psyche were static and would remain so forever. They seemed devoid of all imagination, and they entirely and exclusively depended upon their sense perception. Chances and possibilities did not exist in their world, and in today there was no real tomorrow. The future was just the repetition of the past. I am trying here to give the reader a glimpse of my own first impressions when I began to observe the many people I met. It soon became clear to me, however, that the people who used their minds were those who thought, that is, who applied their intellectual faculty in trying to adapt themselves to people and circumstances. And the equally intelligent people who did not think were those who sought and found their way by feeling. Feeling is a word that needs some explanation. For instance, one speaks of feeling when it is a matter of sentiment, corresponding to the French term sentiment. But one also applies the same word to define an opinion. For example, a communication from the White House may begin, The President feels. Furthermore, the word may be used to express an intuition. I had a feeling as if... When I use the word feeling, in contrast to thinking... I refer to a judgment of value, for instance, agreeable or disagreeable, good or bad, and so on. Feeling, according to this definition, is not an emotion, which, as the word conveys, is involuntary. Feeling, as I mean it, is, like thinking, a rational, that is, ordering function, whereas intuition is an irrational, that is, perceiving function. Insofar as intuition is a hunch, it is not the product of a voluntary act, it is rather an involuntary event which depends upon different external or internal circumstances instead of an act of judgment. Intuition is more like a sense perception, which is also an irrational event insofar as it depends essentially upon objective stimuli, which owe their existence to physical and not to mental causes. These four functional types correspond to the obvious means by which consciousness obtains its orientation to experience. Sensation that is, sense perception, tells you that something exists. Thinking tells you what it is. Feeling tells you whether it is agreeable or not. And intuition tells you whence it comes and where it is going. The reader should understand that these four criteria of types of human behavior are just four viewpoints among many others, like willpower, temperament, imagination, memory, and so on. There is nothing dogmatic about them but their basic nature recommends them as suitable criteria for a classification. I find them particularly helpful when I am called upon to explain parents to children and husbands to wives and vice versa. They are also useful in understanding one's own prejudices. Thus, if you want to understand another person's dream, you have to sacrifice your own predilections and suppress your prejudices. This is not easy or comfortable, because it means a moral effort that is not to everyone's taste. But if the analyst does not make the effort to criticize his own standpoint and to admit its relativity, he will get neither the right information about nor sufficient insight into his patient's mind. The analyst expects at least a certain willingness on the patient's part to listen to his opinion and to take it seriously. And the patient must be granted the same right, Although such a relationship is indispensable for any understanding and is therefore of self-evident necessity, one must remind oneself again and again that it is more important in therapy for the patient to understand than for the analyst's theoretical expectations to be satisfied. The patient's resistance to the analyst's interpretation is not necessarily wrong. 
it is rather a sure sign that something does not click. Either the patient has not yet reached the point where he understands, or the interpretation does not fit. In our efforts to interpret the dream symbols of another person, we are almost invariably hampered by our tendency to fill in the unavoidable gaps in our understanding by projection, that is, by the assumption that what the analyst perceives or thinks is equally perceived or thought by the dreamer. To overcome this source of error, I have always insisted on the importance of sticking to the context of the particular dream and excluding all theoretical assumptions about dreams in general, except for the hypothesis that dreams in some way make sense. It will be clear from all I have said that we cannot lay down general rules for interpreting dreams. When I suggested earlier that the overall function of dreams seems to be to compensate for deficiencies or distortions in the conscious mind, I meant that this assumption opened up the most promising approach to the nature of particular dreams. In some cases, you can see this function plainly demonstrated. One of my patients had a very high opinion of himself and was unaware that almost everyone who knew him was irritated by his air of moral superiority. He came to me with a dream in which he had seen a drunken tramp rolling in a ditch, a sight that evoked from him only the patronizing comment, It's terrible to see how low a man can fall. It was evident that the unpleasant nature of the dream was at least in part an attempt to offset his inflated opinion of his own merits but there was something more to it than this. It turned out that he had a brother who was a degenerate alcoholic. What the dream also revealed was that his superior attitude was compensating the brother as both an outer and an inner figure. In another case, I recall, a woman who was proud of her intelligent understanding of psychology had recurring dreams about another woman. When in ordinary life she met this woman, she did not like her thinking her a vain and dishonest intriguer. But in the dreams, the woman appeared almost as a sister, friendly and likable. My patient could not understand why she should dream so favorably about a person she disliked. But these dreams were trying to convey the idea that she herself was shadowed by an unconscious character that resembled the other woman. It was hard for my patient, who had very clear ideas about her own personality, to realize that the dream was telling her about her own power complex and her hidden motivations, unconscious influences that had more than once led to disagreeable rows with her friends. She had always blamed others for these, not herself. It is not merely the shadow side of our personalities that we overlook, disregard, and repress. We may also do the same to our positive qualities. An example that comes to mind is that of an apparently modest and self-effacing man with charming manners. He always seemed content with a back seat, but discreetly insisted on being present. When asked to speak, he would offer a well-informed opinion, though he never intruded it. But he sometimes hinted that a given matter could be dealt with in a far superior way at a certain higher level, though he never explained how. In his dreams, however, he constantly had encounters with great historical figures such as Napoleon and Alexander the Great. These dreams were clearly compensating for an inferiority complex, but they had another implication. What sort of man must I be, the dream was asking, to have such illustrious callers? In this respect, the dreams pointed to a secret megalomania, which offset the dreamer's feeling of inferiority. This unconscious idea of grandeur insulated him from the reality of his environment and enabled him to remain aloof from obligations that would be imperative for other people. He felt no need to prove, either to himself or to others, that his superior judgment was based on superior merit. He was, in fact, unconsciously playing an insane game, and the dreams were seeking to bring it to the level of consciousness in a curiously ambiguous way. Hobnobbing with Napoleon and being on speaking terms with Alexander the Great are exactly the kind of fantasies produced by an inferiority complex. But why, one asks, could not the dream be open and direct about it, and say what it had to say without ambiguity? I have frequently been asked this question, and I have asked it myself. I am often surprised at the tantalizing way dreams seem to evade definite information or omit the decisive point. Freud assumed the existence of a special function of the psyche, which he called the censor. This, he supposed, twisted the dream images and made them unrecognizable or misleading 
in order to deceive the dreaming consciousness about the real subject of the dream. By concealing the critical thought from the dreamer, the censor protected his sleep against the shock of a disagreeable reminiscence. But I am skeptical about the theory that the dream is a guardian of sleep. Dreams just as often disturb sleep. It rather looks as if the approach to consciousness has a blotting out effect upon the subliminal contents of the psyche. The subliminal state retains ideas and images at a much lower level of tension than they possess in consciousness. In the subliminal condition, they lose clarity of definition. The relations between them are less consequential and more vaguely analogous, less rational and therefore more incomprehensible. This can also be observed in all dreamlike conditions, whether due to fatigue, fever, or toxins. But if something happens to endow any of these images with greater tension, they become less subliminal and, as they come close to the threshold of consciousness, more sharply defined. It is from this fact that one may understand why dreams often express themselves as analogies, why one dream image slides into another, and why neither the logic nor the time scale of our waking life seems to apply. The form that dreams take is natural to the unconscious because the material from which they are produced is retained in the subliminal state in precisely this fashion. Dreams do not guard sleep from what Freud called the incompatible wish, what he called disguise is actually the shape all impulses naturally take in the unconscious. Thus a dream cannot produce a definite thought. If it begins to do so, it ceases to be a dream because it crosses the threshold of consciousness. That is why dreams seem to skip the very points that are most important to the conscious mind and seem rather to manifest the fringe of consciousness like the faint gleam of stars during a total eclipse of the sun. We should understand that dream symbols are for the most part manifestations of a psyche that is beyond the control of the conscious mind. Meaning and purposefulness are not the prerogatives of the mind. They operate in the whole of living nature. There is no difference in principle between organic and psychic growth. As a plant produces its flower, so the psyche creates its symbols. Every dream is evidence of this process. So by means of dreams plus all sorts of intuitions, impulses, and other spontaneous events, instinctive forces influence the activity of consciousness. Whether that influence is for better or for worse depends upon the actual contents of the unconscious. If it contains too many things that normally ought to be conscious, then its function becomes twisted and prejudiced. Motives appear that are not based upon true instincts, but that owe their existence and psychic importance to the fact that they have been consigned to the unconscious by repression or neglect. They overlay, as it were, the normal unconscious psyche and distort its natural tendency to express basic symbols and motifs. Therefore, it is reasonable for a psychoanalyst concerned with the causes of a mental disturbance to begin by eliciting from his patient a more or less voluntary confession and realization of everything that the patient dislikes or fears. This is like the much older confession of the Church, which in many ways anticipated modern psychological techniques. At least this is the general rule. In practice, however, it may work the other way round. Overpowering feelings of inferiority or serious weakness may make it very difficult, even impossible, for the patient to face fresh evidence of his own inadequacy. So I have often found it profitable to begin by giving a positive outlook to the patient. This provides a helpful sense of security when he approaches the more painful insights. Take, as an example, a dream of personal exaltation, in which, for instance, one has tea with the Queen of England, or finds oneself on intimate terms with the Pope. If the dreamer is not a schizophrenic, the practical interpretation of the symbol depends very much upon his present state of mind, that is, the condition of his ego. If the dreamer overestimates his own value, it is easy to show, from the material produced by association of ideas, how inappropriate and childish the dreamer's intentions are, and how much they emanate from childish wishes to be equal to or superior to his parents. But if it is a case of inferiority, where an all-pervading feeling of worthlessness has already overcome every positive aspect of the dreamer's personality, it would be quite wrong to depress him still more by showing how infantile, ridiculous, or even perverse he is. That would cruelly increase his inferiority, as well as cause an unwelcome and quite unnecessary resistance to the treatment. 
There is no therapeutic technique or doctrine that is of general application, since every case that one receives for treatment is an individual in a specific condition. I remember a patient I once had to treat over a period of nine years. I saw him only for a few weeks each year, since he lived abroad. From the start I knew what his real trouble was, but I also saw that the least attempt to get close to the truth was met by a violent defensive reaction that threatened a complete rupture between us. Whether I liked it or not, I had to do my best to maintain our relation and to follow his inclination, which was supported by his dreams and which led our discussion away from the root of his neurosis. We ranged so widely that I often accused myself of leading my patient astray, Nothing but the fact that his condition slowly but clearly improved prevented me from confronting him brutally with the truth. In the tenth year, however, the patient declared himself to be cured and freed from all his symptoms. I was surprised because, theoretically, his condition was incurable. Noticing my astonishment, he smiled and said, in effect, And I want to thank you above all for your unfailing tact and patience in helping me to circumvent the painful cause of my neurosis. I am now ready to tell you everything about it. If I had been able to talk freely about it, I would have told you what it was at my first consultation. But that would have destroyed my rapport with you. Where should I have been then? I should have been morally bankrupt. In the course of ten years I have learned to trust you, and as my confidence grew, my condition improved. I improved because this slow process restored my belief in myself, Now I am strong enough to discuss the problem that was destroying me. He then made a devastatingly frank confession of his problem, which showed me the reasons for the peculiar course our treatment had had to follow. The original shock had been such that alone he had been unable to face it. He needed the help of another, and the therapeutic task was the slow establishment of confidence rather than the demonstration of a clinical theory. From cases like this, I learned to adapt my methods to the needs of the individual patient, rather than to commit myself to general theoretical considerations that might be inapplicable in any particular case. The knowledge of human nature that I have accumulated in the course of sixty years of practical experience has taught me to consider each case as a new one, in which, first of all, I have had to seek the individual approach. Sometimes I have not hesitated to plunge into a careful study of infantile events and fantasies, At other times I have begun at the top, even if this has meant soaring straight into the most remote metaphysical speculations. It all depends on learning the language of the individual patient and following the gropings of his unconscious toward the light. Some cases demand one method and some another. This is especially true when one seeks to interpret symbols. Two different individuals may have almost exactly the same dream. This, as one soon discovers in clinical experience, is less uncommon than the layman may think. Yet, if, for instance, one dreamer is young and the other old, the problem that disturbs them is correspondingly different, and it would be obviously absurd to interpret both dreams in the same way. An example that comes to my mind is a dream in which a group of young men are riding on horseback across a wide field. The dreamer is in the lead, and he jumps a ditch full of water, just clearing this hazard. The rest of the party fall into the ditch. Now, the young man who first told me this dream was a cautious, introverted type. But I also heard the same dream from an old man of daring character who had lived an active and enterprising life. At the time he had this dream, he was an invalid who gave his doctor and nurse a great deal of trouble. He had actually injured himself by his disobedience of medical instructions. It was clear to me that this dream was telling the young man what he ought to do, but it was telling the old man what he actually was still doing. Whereas it encouraged the hesitant young man, the old man was in no such need of encouragement. The spirit of enterprise that still flickered within him was indeed his greatest trouble. This example shows how the interpretation of dreams and symbols largely depends upon the individual circumstances of the dreamer and the condition of his mind. The Archetype in Dream Symbolism I have already suggested that dreams serve the purpose of compensation. This assumption means that the dream is a normal psychic phenomenon that transmits unconscious reactions or spontaneous impulses to consciousness. Many dreams can be interpreted with the help of the dreamer, who provides both the associations to and the context of the dream image, 
by means of which one can look at all its aspects. This method is adequate in all ordinary cases, such as those when a relative, a friend, or a patient tells you a dream more or less in the course of conversation, but when it is a matter of obsessive dreaming or of highly emotional dreams, the personal associations produced by the dreamer do not usually suffice for a satisfactory interpretation. In such cases, we have to take into consideration the fact, first observed and commented on by Freud, that elements often occur in a dream that are not individual and that cannot be derived from the dreamer's personal experience. These elements, as I have previously mentioned, are what Freud called archaic remnants, mental forms whose presence cannot be explained by anything in the individual's own life and which seem to be aboriginal, innate, and inherited shapes of the human mind. Just as the human body represents a whole museum of organs, each with a long evolutionary history behind it, so we should expect to find that the mind is organized in a similar way. It can no more be a product without history than is the body in which it exists. By history, I do not mean the fact that the mind builds itself up by conscious reference to the past through language and other cultural traditions. I am referring to the biological, prehistoric, and unconscious development of the mind in archaic man, whose psyche was still close to that of the animal. This immensely old psyche forms the basis of our mind, just as much as the structure of our body is based on the general anatomical pattern of the mammal. The trained eye of the anatomist or the biologist finds many traces of this original pattern in our bodies. The experienced investigator of the mind can similarly see the analogies between the dream pictures of modern man and the products of the primitive mind, its collective images and its mythological motifs. Just as the biologist needs the science of comparative anatomy, however, the psychologist cannot do without a comparative anatomy of the psyche. In practice, to put it differently, the psychologist must have a sufficient experience not only of dreams and other products of unconscious activity, but also of mythology in its widest sense. Without this equipment, nobody can spot the important analogies. It is not possible, for instance, to see the analogy between a case of compulsion neurosis and that of a classical demonic possession without a working knowledge of both. My views about the archaic remnants, which I call archetypes or primordial images, have been constantly criticized by people who lack a sufficient knowledge of the psychology of dreams and of mythology. The term archetype is often misunderstood as meaning certain definite mythological images or motifs, but these are nothing more than conscious representations. It would be absurd to assume that such variable representations could be inherited. The archetype is a tendency to form such representations of a motif, representations that can vary a great deal in detail without losing their basic pattern. There are, for instance, many representations of the motif of the hostile brethren, but the motif itself remains the same. My critics have incorrectly assumed that I am dealing with inherited representations, and on that ground they have dismissed the idea of the archetype as mere superstition. They have failed to take into account the fact that if archetypes were representations that originated in our consciousness, or were acquired by consciousness, we should surely understand them, and not be bewildered and astonished when they present themselves in our consciousness. They are indeed an instinctive trend, as marked in the impulse of birds to build nests or ants to form organized colonies. Here I must clarify the relation between instincts and archetypes. What we properly call instincts are physiological urges and are perceived by the senses, but at the same time they also manifest themselves in fantasies and often reveal their presence only by symbolic images. These manifestations are what I call the archetypes. They are without known origin, and they reproduce themselves in any time or in any part of the world even where transmission by direct descent or cross-fertilization through migration must be ruled out. I can remember many cases of people who have consulted me because they were baffled by their own dreams or by their children's. They were at a complete loss to understand the terms of the dreams. The reason was that the dreams contained images that they could not relate to anything they could remember or could have passed on to their children, yet some of these patients were highly educated. A few of them were actually psychiatrists themselves. I vividly recall the case of a professor who had had a sudden vision and thought he was insane. He came to see me in a state of complete panic. 
I simply took a 400-year-old book from the shelf and showed him an old woodcut depicting his very vision. There's no reason for you to believe that you're insane, I said to him. They knew about your vision 400 years ago. Whereupon he sat down, entirely deflated, but once more normal. A very important case came to me from a man who himself was a psychiatrist. One day he brought me a handwritten booklet he had received as a Christmas present from his ten-year-old daughter. It contained a whole series of dreams she had had when she was eight. They made up the weirdest series of dreams that I have ever seen, and I could well understand why the father was more than just puzzled by them. Though childlike, they were uncanny, and they contained images whose origin was wholly incomprehensible to the father. Here are the relevant motifs from the dreams. 1. The evil animal, a snake-like monster with many horns, kills and devours all other animals. But God comes from the four corners, being in fact four separate gods, and gives rebirth to all the dead animals. 2. An ascent into heaven, where pagan dances are being celebrated, and a descent into hell, where angels are doing good deeds. 3. A horde of small animals frightens the dreamer. The animals increase to a tremendous size, and one of them devours the little girl. 4. A small mouse is penetrated by worms, snakes, fishes, and human beings. Thus the mouse becomes human. This portrays the four stages of the origin of mankind. 5. A drop of water is seen as it appears when looked at through a microscope. The girl sees that the drop is full of tree branches. This portrays the origin of the world. 6. A bad boy has a clod of earth and throws bits of it at everyone who passes. In this way, all the passers-by become bad. 7. A drunken woman falls into the water and comes out renewed and sober. 8. The scene is in America, where many people are rolling on an ant heap, attacked by the ants. The dreamer, in a panic, falls into a river. 9. There is a desert on the moon, where the dreamer sinks so deeply into the ground that she reaches hell. 10. In this dream, the girl has a vision of a luminous ball. She touches it. Vapors emanate from it. A man comes and kills her. 11. The girl dreams she...